Welcome to Design 30. My name is Jason Bilyeu, and in this podcast, I provide design strategies and tools to improve creativity, innovation, and overall design confidence. Welcome to Monday, and welcome to another episode of Design 30. Today, we will be diving into a few more phases of the whole design thinking process. Uh, And instead of doing one of these phases, today we're going to do three of them because they're very closely related to each other. And in fact, they're much more, uh, they work much more of like a cycle, uh, more so than the other steps we've discussed. So we will be going through three of them today. So this episode is probably going to be a little bit more faster paced. Um, But before we get into that, as always, make sure to follow Design30 on X, on Instagram, and on YouTube. Uh, Additionally, you can become a subscriber on Substack. I recently just published uh, another article yesterday. This one is titled, Is Elon Musk's Idiot Index Actually Useful? So you maybe with Elon Musk's new book coming out, you've heard about this idea of the idiot index, which I think is actually a pretty interesting idea and was worth spending a little bit more time uh, diving into and writing about. So that was sent out yesterday. If you're a subscriber to the Substack, it should be in your email. If not, you can also find uh, that same article on Medium, where I've recently just started publishing articles as well. So if you're a fan of Medium, which I'm starting to become uh, more and more a fan of it, it's it's pretty simple, really easy to use, and there's a lot of interesting content on there. So if you're not a part of the Substack, feel free to head over to Medium, and you can find it there as well. Okay, let's dive into what we're going to be talking about today, which is three different phases of design thinking. This is the prototype phase, the test phase, and then finally the iterate phase. And the reason I want to do all three of these uh, in one episode all together, because it doesn't really make sense to just talk about prototyping without also going into what you're doing with those prototypes and that's testing. And then once you're testing them, what do you do once you get the feedback from the users? So we're gonna go through all three and discuss how they they operate essentially as a cycle, interact with each other. And you'll also see this testing and iterating later on in this design thinking process uh, as you move into the uh, implementation phase of design thinking that's much more how, at least to me, and people might have different ideas of this, it definitely depends on what industry you're working on. But for my industry, that implementation phase is when you've committed to an idea and you start going into much more of a real alpha prototype, a real beta prototype. Uh, You're doing verification testing on all of your requirements and then moving into your validation testing. So that's much more of of maybe what you would expect from a typical product development process, a lot more intense, a lot more money intensive, perhaps a lot more people involved. So we'll get into that uh, at a later date, uh, but just just know that this testing and iterating, it's not, in reality, it's not just these distinct steps that you do them once, go through them, and then you move on to the next thing. These are these are phases that kind of exist and overlap with a lot of the other phases in the whole design thinking process. So today, we're going to be talking about how those two interact and overlap with the prototyping phase. So when you're thinking about prototyping in this design thinking process, one of the core ideas is you don't want to sink a bunch of money into these expensive prototypes, a bunch of design time into these expensive prototypes. Those are things that will, they won't allow you to test and iterate rapidly. They're going to slow you down, right? They're going to take, they could push it out months of design time. Some prototypes are going to take weeks to potentially a month or two to get manufactured. It really slows down this whole process. 
So one of the key parts of this prototyping phase is figuring out how to make these low fidelity, these simple, uh, non-expensive, uh, essentially just really uh, low cost and fast is kind of the two things you want to go for. They still need to represent the idea that you're going for. So you're going to be pulling ideas from your ideation phase, these different concepts that you've chosen to actually uh, prototype and test. Uh, so they need to represent the core aspects and the core concepts of those ideas that, that you're actually wanting to test. Um, but you don't want to go so far as to dumping hours and hours and weeks of time into designing these things and then into manufacturing and building them. It's just not going to be a viable solution uh, as far as cost goes <clears throat> or as far as time goes as well. So you're looking at building these low fidelity prototypes. And I've referenced this in the past. I've called those prototypes, uh, which is something that uh, we talked a lot about in my grad school program, which essentially is just a pre-prototype because a lot of people think of prototype as more of an alpha or a beta system. These very uh, highly polished, not, not necessarily highly polished, but more polished, very functional, typically expensive systems. Uh, but in this case, you want to go with a prototype. That's something that it, you can build it probably just from cardboard. It might be, it could even be as simple as storyboarding a process. If a process is what you're designing, it could be uh, using a PowerPoint to, to simulate uh, what you think your app is going to look like. And, and using that as what you're actually going to put in front of people as you move to the next phase, which is testing. Um, but yeah, so it's something that is, it's very simple. For example, uh, in the grad school project, I've talked a lot about on here where we were working on designing a new coffee maker. Uh, we literally just found some old uh, soda bottles. We found pieces of cardboard. We went through the recycling and found all of just kind of these random things that might have looked like trash or literally literally been trash and we use those to create these prototypes that we used and essentially you're just trying to capture this core function what's what's the core aspect of this design that you want to get feedback on from potential users the people who are going to be testing it and th that's a bit of an art and a science in and of itself Sometimes it can be hard to, to, to feel like you're creating something that's actually worthwhile, but I think you'll surprise yourself once you dive into it, that you'll actually be able to come up with something that conveys the concept to other people. And what, what we did with ours, after we had these built up, these very simple, uh, very, uh, thing, maybe garbage looking designs literally look like just bottles and paper and stuff you'd find from the garage. But once we had it all put together, it, it very much looked like real products that so you could actually get an idea of what they were trying to convey. And we proved that out when we moved into the testing phase where we, we took all of these prototypes, put them in a box and we just went to downtown Boulder uh, on Pearl street. If you've been, it's a a very active, beautiful street, lots of people walking around. And we just kind of set up shop uh, in the middle of the street and waited for people to come by. Usually all of our stuff sitting out would, would catch somebody's eye and that's how you would kind of reel them in. And yeah, you would just have them, essentially would just hand them one of these prototypes and see what they thought of it. And the first step of that was you didn't want to tell them exactly what it was, what it was supposed to do and all that. You, tr it was better just to kind of let them look at it and see if they could figure out uh, what was going on with it before you gave them any additional information. So you get an idea of how, what the visuals of it, what this concept visually was conveying to a potential user. And of course, like I said, these were very low fidelity. There were bottles and cardboard. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't very easy for these people to figure out what was going on. But surprisingly, a lot of them actually had, uh, some really good or well, right away, they were able to figure out essentially what a lot of the products were. 
And that was, that was pretty fun to see. It really validated this whole process and showed that even though it is a low fidelity prototype and it's potentially has similarities to what you would see in the recycling bin, you could actually get some really good and interesting feedback. So we would ask these people if we could film <clears throat> or record their feedback and so that we could review that later on is something again i've talked a lot about on here is actually filming and recording how users interact with your prototypes how they interact with your designs it's a great way to capture a lot more information about your product and about your design than you are in the actual conversation because there's a lot of stuff you're going to miss but when you can go back and watch it and look at it you're going to see and pick up little hints and details and you're going to see the struggles perhaps that the user has trying to figure out how to use your product so it's really valuable if possible to actually film those and record them so you can go back later on and and see how it went so then after we had these people go through all of these initial ideas we had I think it was about five or six initial concepts that came from our ideation phase that we built up into prototypes and, and had these just random people, these strangers, these random users coming through the street. I had them look at it, give us feedback. We recorded all of that. Um, and we wanted that to be, we figured we could reach our, our target market in that area because it, Boulder is full of a lot of these young, busy professionals, which is exactly the type of person that we were going for. It's also full of a lot of people who enjoy coffee and also enjoy the coffee making experience. So it was a good, uh, good subset of people that we had look at these and it was actually a very effective uh, testing strategy and a really effective way to get uh, information uh, from real potential users. But one thing to note here, if you're going to be designing something that is potentially something you'll patent and you uh, you need to actually protect those ideas, you probably don't want to do this. You don't want to go out in the street and just publicly disclose all of your ideas and your, uh, your technology, what you might potentially be able to patent. Uh, in that case, you're going to have to figure out some other way to have a much more, uh, probably bring people in to a private room, something like that, have them sign NDAs, something along those lines. So that's uh, it's something to keep in mind if you are going to do this. Be very careful of publicly disclosing uh, something that could be a part of your patent or a patentable idea. Because once it's publicly disclosed, now the game's kind of over as far as patents go, and that could be a huge problem. So make sure you understand what you're showing people. And if you need to do it in some sort of private area, private room, and make sure you have people signing NDAs. So that was a side note. What did we do after this user testing and after having these people stumble upon us in the street and check out all of our ideas? Well, we took all the information and what we learned from them and we went back through uh, an iteration phase, which is very similar to the ideation phase, but rather than coming up with all sorts of random broad new ideas, it's a little bit more narrowed and focused. You're taking the feedback that you just gained from these people and you're figuring out how to iterate these prototypes that you've already designed, coming up with new ideas, maybe slight modifications. There could potentially be a completely new idea that surfaced during that process. Uh, that's also an acceptable outcome from this iteration phase. However, the reason why it's different from the initial ideation phase that we talked about is it is a, it's more focused, right? You're trying to focus a lot more on, on what you've actually created so far and the specific feedback that you've gotten. So that's really probably the only difference, just a little bit more narrow, but you are still, you should still be pushing to and encouraging your team to have uh, some crazy ideas, big ideas, random ideas, all of those things, and kind of running them through this filter of the feedback that you got from these prototypes. Uh, what you, could you add to these prototypes that would potentially allow you to test whatever new ideas you come up with? And you iterate. You create new new prototypes, new prototypes, new 
pieces of cardboard that convey your ideas and maybe a new spreadsheets, new uh, PowerPoints, whatever you're using to test out or to create these ideas that you're displaying to these this user base that is doing your user testing. So that's the iteration phase. And then, like, like I kind of already mentioned, it kind of neatly folds back into a prototyping phase. Maybe it's just updating your prototypes. And now you're back into user testing again. So this is why I've put all I put all three of these together instead of doing each one in separate episodes because it makes more sense to think about it as this iterative process, kind of this iterative process within this overall design thinking process. And so again, at high level, what are we doing with these three phases? Well, the point is before you go and invest a ton of money, a ton of time, and developing and prototyping and creating alphas and betas and and all of these what would be called high fidelity prototypes these high fidelity alpha and beta systems before you sink all of that money into an idea that you actually don't really have any i mean you have some idea of whether or not the market's going to like it but you don't know uh, how people are going to react to you haven't if you follow sometimes more of a traditional process you haven't done any user testing yet to to get feedback on it so this what this process does is allow you to test a lot more ideas a much wider range of ideas with yes simpler prototypes but you get to go through a lot more ideas at a lot lower cost to the company so it's something that you're much more likely to actually be able to afford. You're much more likely to be able to fit it into the business case and get your management team to sign off on it. And then you're also involving users a lot earlier in the development process than you would if you're waiting till perhaps all the way until a beta system to get it in the hands of your users. So you're getting a lot of valuable information you're being able to get feedback on these very specific ideas that you come up with, and you're already able to iterate and update these prototypes, uh, gain some insight perhaps on how these different ideas uh, will be manufactured in the long run. <clears throat> so you'll be able to um, already be thinking about that as the engineer, as the designer, and gaining some feedback on that as you're building the prototypes yourself and understanding what's going to be difficult to manufacture, what's going to probably be easier or less expensive to manufacture. So this whole cycle of prototyping, testing, iterating, it not only helps you get insights into what the user wants and what their user experience is going to be like and if it's an attractive, interesting product, it also gives you a lot of information on how you're going to uh, move forward with this once you are, are actually committed to an idea and you're moving into this uh, more expensive, highly committed development phase. So at the end of the day, if you invest time and you commit to this process early on of prototyping, testing, and iterating, you're going to be able to save your company a lot more money in the long run because this is a very low cost process. Uh, it's very fast process that the whole whole point of it is to is to rapidly iterate these rapidly prototype get ideas in front of users test them have them test and get the feedback iterate again maybe run through that process one more time and so you're doing this quickly and cheaply you're doing it very inexpensively so that is going to allow you to get a lot more feedback than investing a bunch of money and time uh, and resources into developing even an alpha prototype or an alpha system. And then at that point, if you realize you've missed something crucial or you've designed something that uh, your market is interested in, something that is incredibly not user-friendly, if you have to redesign that and go back through that whole process, you've already sunk in a lot more time and money and materials into that prototype, into that alpha level prototype than you have uh, if you would have gone through this this prototyping process, this pre-prototypes, these inexpensive, low fidelity prototypes, where you've probably a lot of the, a lot of the potential uh, gotchas or issues, or even just user feedback things users don't like, you probably could have worked through a lot of those in this 
fast paced iterative cycle than having to wait all the way until you have this alpha prototype or this beta pro or well full level full beta system full alpha system so that's why you want to if at all possible implement this process a lot earlier before you have invested all of that time and money and resources and that's also something to keep in mind as you're pitching this to your leadership team is that in a lot of ways, even though it might push out your your schedule as far as how quickly you can get to your alpha system or your beta system, it's going to, in the long run, produce a better product. And it's also going to allow you to get to that product spending less money and less investment and less investment of resources into this product development cycle. And that's where I'm going to leave it today. So we discussed these three phases of the design thinking process. Uh, In the previous episodes, we discussed uh, the empathetic uh, phase. We went through the define phase and then the ideate phase. And now I've combined the prototype test and iterate into a single episode, but they are three distinct phases that just work iteratively. And they, there's a lot of overlap between the three of them. And so next, moving into, uh, we will be moving into the implementation phase, which is, it's a lot more, it's a lot more of what I talked about with this alpha system and beta system, verification testing, validation testing, that sort of thing. So that will be the next episode on the design thinking process. We'll, we will be diving into that. Um, but for today, I think I'm going to leave it uh, where we're at with this prototype test iterate Remember that this is going to save you money in the long long run, and it's going to end up with a better product. So that's how you're going to pitch it to your leadership team. Uh, Before we go, one more reminder that uh, if you want to read my recent article, which I've titled, Is Elon Musk's Musk's Idiot Index Actually Useful? Uh, Which I think is a, a pretty interesting idea, pretty interesting concept. So please uh, become a subscriber to the Substack if you want to just get an email version of all of those or just go find it on Medium. You might even be able to just Google it and have the Medium article pop up. So go try that out. And yeah, if you have thoughts or comments or questions, uh, you can comment directly on the post or feel free to shoot me a message on X or Instagram or via email. All right, that will do it for this week. As always, have a great week. And remember, design more, despair less. Thanks for listening.